Hi, this is Roger Moore, and you're listening to James Bond Radio. Hello, and welcome to James Bond Radio. This week, we are talking to Bond author Mark Edlitz, the writer of The Many Lives of James Bond and the new book that's just come out, The Lost Adventures of James Bond. My name is Tom Sears, and I am joined by another fella, another other fella, I should say, Mr. Jack Lugo, our man in New Jersey. How are you doing, Jack? I'm okay, Tom. Um, yeah, so uh, this is an exciting uh, episode for me. I'm, uh, I just, I, I, Mark was kind enough to send me a copy of his new book, The Lost Adventures of James Bond. Uh, and then as a full kind of disclosure thing, um, when Mark was writing this book uh, last year, uh, in 2019, which seems like a lifetime ago, um, he, uh, we, we became friends and uh, basically I, I kind of just gave him some feedback on, on the, uh, on, on, you know, the early drafts that I was reading, uh, which was a, a really, you know, I feel honored and privileged that he, that he would ask me. And I just wanted to, you know, just to let everyone know that, you know, we, you know, uh, you know that, that that happened. Uh, so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy that I've become friends with Mark. And, you know, Mate, and, you are yeah. immortalized in Bondian history now. You are, you, you, you've been <laughs> yes. involved in a Bond book that's in print, it's out there in the world. Your name's even in there. What a beautiful thing, man. That's, uh, yes. That's, uh, yeah, your name is in the acknowledgement, acknowledgement, uh, acknowledgement too. He's a, he's a big uh, JBR fan. Um, and, um, you know, we're just happy to. Yeah. That, do you know what that was news to me because I I saw when when you got your because he if you hold it up again because you he sent you like a, a sort of pre not for sale version didn't he like an, an early print a proof copy or something isn't that it yes. say, yeah it says like not yeah. for sale on he, the cover or something yeah and he he was kind enough to to to, to personalize it too for me so um so yeah it, it, it you know it, it was just uh you know uh, I mean, uh, it's just been a great you know. Um, well, that's it. To be a part of, yeah. Well, yeah, I saw you post that you that you'd been uh, name checked in the acknowledgements, and then so we posted all over our thing saying, "Yay, yeah, Jack!" And we didn't even realise we'd got a mention too because we uh, hadn't seen the book at that point. So it was uh, that was lovely to get a shout out from Mark as well. Thank you. He, he obviously uh, embraced a lot of the Bond fan community geeks like us, and and uh, you know everybody else doing their fan related medias and stuff. So that was that was a n- lovely surprise, man. Um, yeah, absolutely. So uh, in other uh, Jack. Luke, Go news. I uh, just wanted to give you a shout out for that uh, Mike Grell interview that you did recently, man, because that was a beauty. I think that was uh, you and Dan double teamed him, didn't you? Yeah, uh, that was incredible. I mean, Mike uh, wrote, I think, what was it's probably the best Bond comic I've come across so far. And there's just so many nuggets in there for uh, anyone who's, uh, you know, it, you know, wants to discover, uh, you know, what, what we talk about. I mean, he has Karen Bay's uh, daughters in there, the different sort of references to the films. Um, so, and he, he was just a great guy to talk to. So definitely check that interview out if you haven't yeah. seen it yet. That was a great one, man. Yeah, absolutely. I thoroughly enjoyed it myself. Good stuff. All right, then. So before we uh, hand it over to Mark, I'm going to do, uh, Jack, for long-time listeners will remember this, but I, I'm, <laughs> I've forgotten to do it for the last year, which is the JBR spiel. And I'm, it's going to be, it's an updated JBR spiel. I'm going to do it now. So make sure you pay attention, everybody at home. Here we go. <clears throat> make sure you subscribe to the JBR YouTube channel. Just put James Bond Radio into the YouTube search and you will find the YouTube channel. Also subscribe to the audio podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts or any podcast app. There's some stuff on there that we don't post on YouTube. That's the only way to hear our Music of Bond series, for example. Uh, make sure you follow us on Facebook. Just put James Bond Radio into the search. Follow us on Twitter, at James Bond Radio. Follow us on Instagram, which is at James Bond Podcast. And of course, you can head on over to jamesbondradio.com where you can find all sorts of Bondian fun. And last but not least, if you do listen on Apple Podcasts, it would be lovely if you'd leave us a lovely glowing five-star review as that helps us rank higher in the searches and attract more listeners. I haven't said that in many a moon. And there it is again. So, uh, yeah. That's a beautiful time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. Thanks, man. So, yeah, absolutely. If uh, Make sure you do all those things, anybody listening at home, because that's uh, that helps the podcast in a huge way. All right, then, Jack, are you ready to talk to Mark? Yes, I am. Let's do it. It's time to talk to author of The Lost Adventures of James Bond, Mr. Mark Edlitz. My name's Bond. James Bond. Bond. James Bond. Bond, what do you think you're doing? Keeping the British end up, sir. Welcome to James Bond Radio. News, reviews, and discussion of all things 007. Bye. 
Mark Edlitz. Welcome to James Bond Radio. I'm thrilled to be here and it's great to see you both. It's great to see you, Tom, and great to see you, Jack. It's great to have you back. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of your books, as, as you know, and, um, you know, it's just great to have you back on the show. Dude, I, what I will say, Mark, is I think you're an unstoppable machine when it comes to Bond books, because not only with The Many Lives of James Bond did you write a, a great book that sort of took the Bond world of fandom by storm, you've come straight back with another one that is a book I've always wanted somebody to write. I always think one of the most fascinating things when it comes to Bond is the what might have been things you know like often we say you know what would George's version of Diamonds Are Forever look like or what would it been like with Pierce in the Living Daylights all those kinds of things that really sets the your imagination on fire and you've come back with you know a book all about that man so what 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 inspired you to do that so soon after writing The Many Lives of James Bond you're back with this new one The Lost Adventures of James Bond what set it all off for you? Uh, great question uh First of all, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, James Bond Radio and the work that you all do has been sort of the baseline uh, for my work and inspired me to, to write about Bond. So oh, thank you. that's very kind to of you here. to say. Thank you. Uh, I didn't intend to write two books on James Bond. I figured after the many lives of James Bond, I figured one book would sort of do the trick and get it out of my system. But when I was organizing that first book, I I, when I started writing that first book, I, I cast a wide net and I let my Bond fandom and interest and curiosity take me wherever. And so I interviewed a lot of people about a lot of topics. And then I was putting it together, I realized that the book was just too long and wouldn't have been focused. So I organized The Many Lives of James Bond into a character study on James Bond through its creators as well as interviews with actors who have played James Bond in different media. So anything that didn't fall into that category had to go. Nice. What didn't fall into that category are lost, unmade, forgotten, incomplete Bond stories. Uh, and, the, and so that is a wide berth. And we could go into what makes a lost story an unmade story or incomplete or forgotten story. But so that became the basis of the second book, The Lost Adventures. And this second book is actually 100 pages longer than the first. It was really not intended to be that long. It, it just, once I started writing, it, it became so fascinating to me that I kept on going and going and going. And this new, th this new book is like 424 pages and the last one was 318. Good Lord, man. Yeah, yeah it's, it's one of those things I think you couldn't, as, as long as there's something to talk about and, and to discover, you could just go on forever. Because you imagine the, the amount of drafts that movies go through, the amount of ideas that get thrown around over the years, man. It, you, I mean, you could probably write 10 books just on these lost adventures and stuff. So, uh, so that's awesome, man. So, um, so yeah, so the kind of, I suppose the first question I need to ask you actually is if for people watching on YouTube is either side of your head right now, you've got little posters of uh, the cover. So you've got the lost adventures of James Bond on the left and you've got Timothy Dalton on the cover there. And then on the right, you've got a Walter PPK that's sort of like dissolving. They're both sort of dissolving into, into nothingness, which I think is a nice little touch. So what's the story with those two covers, man? Because when I Google the book, I see that they're both available. So what's, what's going on there? Uh, so both of those covers were, were designed by Sean, uh, who is an amazing Bond artist and whose works I admire. Trying to find a cover for the book was a, a huge challenge and an undertaking. And the cover helps explain to the audience what the book is, as well as define it. And while we were talking, Sean and I were talking, we had lots of different ideas. But the idea was to visually show uh, something that was lost and how do you how do you show that and so he came up with two ideas one with the with the gun disappearing and one with Timothy Dalton disappearing uh, so there, there are it gives the impression that there's two different copies of the book it's the same book it's the same content it's the same words uh, and and this is just a, a publishing thing that I learned while while doing it that there were different uh, printers and different manufacturers and different systems for getting your book out there. And so the Amazon cover is essentially the Dalton cover and the bookstores and libraries are the, the gun cover. The, the Dalton cover, I prefer the layout of it a little bit better, but the, the, the gun cover has a little, uh, the I like the paper quality. 
so I, I would say go with the, the Dalton cover, uh, but it's the same book, same words. Or get both of them. Why not? <laughs> yeah. I, 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 <laughs> there you I, go. You, you often see that with magazines, don't you, where they have like 10 collector's covers that you have to buy the whole set. So that would be my advice to everybody at home. Now, the big, the big deal is, man, about this book, I think, and that's the very presence of Dalton. And Jack, I know you're, you're itching to ask him a question about that. So why don't you uh, lead the way with the, with the Dalton salvo of questioning? Yeah, I mean, what I find the Dalton stuff fascinating just beyond. So, um, you know, your book uncovers not just one unmade Dalton movie, which I think most of us fans, you know, sort of think about that that six year gap as well. They started to develop a, a movie for Dalton's third movie, and then uh, you know things, you know, it never materialized. But you know, it was just one project that just never materialized. Your book actually uncovers like three um, different, or, or or even you might even maybe even four that that you know because there there were two different incarnations of what would have been uh bond 17 um and then there was the plans for the fourth one and then there was also uh and uh, 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 uh going back before to like 1985 they started developing a possible origin story that would have been instead of the living daylights that we know would have been the living daylights but as dalton as an origin so um can you talk a little bit about that yeah i'd love to uh, so one of the great what ifs, uh, to use Tom's phrase, is what would Timothy Dalton's third Bond have been like? We, I think all Bond fans sort of universally love Timothy Dalton as Bond and see that he made two very different kinds of Bond movies. The first one, uh, The Living Daylights, is a sort of, it's a classic Bond movie. Uh, it's in keeping with the franchise, the, all the preceding films to that point. License to Kill was a huge departure, uh, both uh, tonally, subject matter, the approach, there was no world domination. It was, it was what, we, you know, we say gritty and realistic is sort of the, the shorthand for Bond fans. And so with the third film, people wondered, would they have continued on with that License to Kill trajectory, or that, would they have reverted back to Living Daylight, or would have they done something completely different? And the answer is yes. <laughs> all, of the, all of the above. Um, and it really uh, depends on, there's different, as Jack was saying, there's different avenues for Bond 17. There wasn't just one story, but one of the stories um, is with Alphonse, that, that was written, was written by Alphonse Ruggiero and uh, Michael G. Wilson. Uh, Alphonse was a writer of uh, Miami Vice and a TV show called Wise Guy which was a character-based mafia uh, a crime thing. I, 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 maybe, I, maybe mafia is... Um, Dude, you, you, you kind you, of a precursor to The Sopranos. I, I, yeah. Do you know that's so funny? that, that I, As soon as you said that, I was like, that rings a vague bell. And I've just, I remember that being, I never saw the show, but I remember seeing the, uh, the ads for it on TV when I was a kid back in the day. Yeah, that's, that's so funny. It's a little lost memory for me there. But the, the, the wise guy is really important to mentioned because when people talk about Alphonse and Bond, they say Miami Vice and they got him because of his work on Miami Vice and the drugs. And it sort of incorrectly links it to the subject matter of license to kill. He wasn't, they didn't, that wasn't the main draw according to him of why he was hired. Uh, he was hired in part because of his character work and in part because he, he was a TV writer and they needed to, uh, they, TV writers are used to working under fast deadlines, and there was a fast deadline. Uh, and so there's a lot of misinformation about what Bond 17 would have been like. And, you know, there's all this talk of Bond versus Terminator and what a terrible idea that was. And my goal of the book was not to say this was a good idea or a bad idea, but to explain the context for these decisions and to explain that what they were thinking. And they were really trying to go back to the to a smart, you know, more like from Rush with Love, more more character based, more uh, you know, action thriller, uh, and the and he also uh, clears up a lot of misconceptions about what the film would have been called, and so I, I think I'm the only person who, have, who has tracked him down, and it took me literally years to get an interview with him, 
so and and to find him and then to get him to engage with me and to pick up a time to talk to him so that when we finally did talk he he picked up the phone and said you know are you surprised i i picked up the, the call and i actually answered it and i was because i <laughs> never thought it would get together and i think that you know that the interview is one of the most valuable pieces about this book uh in terms of explaining what tip what one iteration of timothy dalton's third bond would have been like mm. now i'm gonna take a quick breath and then we can talk about a different iteration all right okay <laughs> yeah the, do you know the, the the one that always sticks out in my mind is the 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 one about was it the robots or the artificial intelligence or something that was that was the the backdrop wasn't it for that third one which yeah. right, when i think of timothy i'm like that sounds bananas crazy but, but there would have been a sequence where he faces off against like a a, a, a female security officer who was revealed to be like a, a fembot <laughs> for lack of a better word no, <laughs> roger can get away with that but not timothy yeah. i don't think that's yeah. Well, uh, uh, Pat, who did all the illustrations for my first uh, book, also did illustrations for this one. And one of the things that we came up with an idea is, can he illustrate things, moments from these what ifs that haven't existed? Mm -hmm. So he illustrate. So let's go to the the the, um, the 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 second iteration of Bond Three. This one's a, this one's an action comedy. Um, and it takes some of the, the, the broad elements of uh, Ruggiero and Wilson's and spins it off in a different direction. And I consider it a different work. While, while there are broad elements. Uh, yeah, it's the same villain, I believe. And the uh, same character names. Yeah. It's a different story. There's, their version of Bond 17 is an action comedy. And in one sequence they have, uh, and, and the main theme of that is sort of, I'm getting too old for this stuff. You know, so Bond feels he's past his prime. He's not, he's no longer as competent or as confident as he normally has been. He, he, he fails things. He's, uh, when he does something well, he's a little bit um, sh surprised or shocked because uh, he, he hasn't, the, the, that film would have really been about him getting his mojo back. Um, and anyway, in, in one sequence, Timothy Dalton's uh, Bond would have gone to a rodeo and had a, get in disguise and as a cowboy. And now the idea of Timothy Dalton as, as a cowboy is kind of a, of a funny one. Yeah. And, and how would that work? And it's so, and it's meant to be a fish out of water. But one thing that, that, that Pat did is he illustrated that. And it's a, he did an incredible illustration of, uh, of uh, Timothy Dalton as a cowboy, uh, which I will quickly, sh for you, I know that your po the podcast won't get, uh, am I getting it? Oh, there it is. Oh, yeah. You did a terrible job. So. Take, that's it. Hold it there. That's it. Yeah, that's right. right there. I tell you, he does make a good cowboy, though. I'll tell you that. Yeah. It looks great. Yeah. So, so he helped Pat uh, helped us imagine what these lost sequences would have been like, even if they sound over the top. He found a way to be like, well, this is how it would work. Yeah, th those illustrations. Yeah, I mean, and, and and there are tons of them in your book. So, um, you know, I mean, he does a, a, an extraordinary job just imagining what these sequences might have looked like, and you know, uh, so yeah, kudos to him. You know what? With that, with that description, obviously there was the 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 whole thing about Tim coming back for his third, and then stepping down. It does make you wonder where he looked, whether he looked at that script and was like, "Nah, you're right, mate. I'll give it a miss. Thanks." <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Although I think uh, some of that, like the bit about uh, Bond sort of losing his confidence, that did come from Tim, I, I believe. Um, some of uh, some of that input is that he wanted to explore that. He he wanted to make it more of a character based uh, uh, story. He wanted to go back to the, to some of the roots. He wanted to explore the character of Bond, and uh, the second iteration. The, sometimes they in one of the interviews they said, um, "I'm not sure if we served." Uh, Timothy Dalton's uh, vision in a way that he wanted by making it more of an action comedy. But the, the first, with Alphonse uh, and Michael G. Wilson, I think it, it, he did serve th their, his intended vision, Dalton's intended vision. Yeah, um, and then there, there's also a bit where he, he, um, 
he references uh, at the end of the movie, obviously, he, no surprise, he, he, he ends up with the one girl uh, whose name is Connie, I believe. And, um, you know, he, he's like, oh, well, you should have seen the time that I went up against Blofeld and I went up against Goldfinger and, and on job. That would have been a very curious choice. I mean, how, Tom, how would you feel if, if, if Dalton's Bond had said, oh, well, remember that time that I went up against Goldfinger? <laughs> yeah, I, it would depend on how they did it. If it was literally a conversation like that, I think I would probably hate it. It's I, like, I, on the one hand, I always love those references, you know, like with, with Bond, Felix and Della, where, where he catches the thing and she says, did I say something wrong? And he says he was married once and all that kind of stuff. Those low level little references like that, that are under the radar to, to casual viewers, but to geeks like us is like, oh, look at that. You know, I love those things. When it's too on the nose, I th- I'm just like, ah, I find that a turn off. I feel like, there, obviously there's that scene in majesties where he's going through his drawer and there's all the relics in there. Like, I, I feel like that's, that's as far as I would ever want to take that. You know what I mean? It's like when you, when you've got the sort of the music from those movies playing while he's, you know, looking at the watch and all that kind of stuff. And, and it, so, yeah, it, it's a dangerous game that for sure. But man, Timmy sitting there saying, Oh, it was like that time I took on Goldfinger. No, nah, man, I would not enjoy that at all. What, what, what are your thoughts on that, Mark? <laughs> No, I, I completely agree with you. I think it's it's a bridge too far. I think that an oblique reference to a, a a past event that you don't need to know what he's referring to. When 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 Bond goes to when Roger Moore's Bond goes to the graveside and for your eyes only, John Glenn told me that he wrote that as a bridge between one actor and, and another back actor, in case Roger Moore. Uh, didn't come back and it was a way to link them and similarly to the scene that you're referring to on the Majesty's Secret Service obviously it was a way to link Lazenby with Connery and that was probably as far as you should ever push it it's a, otherwise one of the things that these the Bond films have done well is they let you know that they've seen all those films that you've seen but they don't push it too far and I think this is an example of what would have happened if they did push it too far yeah. where it becomes too self-referential. Uh, it's better not to keep on reflecting your past movies. It's better to start uh, forging ahead. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, it's one of those things. I suppose it's part of the creative process in a sense, isn't it? It's like it's almost like a good thing to be like, let's just throw some extreme ideas out there and just see what happens. And then you obviously look back and you go, nah, that's terrible. We're not, we're not doing anything. And, and, and that's an important thing, what you just said. And... When you look for, and we'll get to it in a second, for the, the, the James Bond origin story, uh, there, I think there, there's so many different outlines. There's a 17 page, a 35 page, a 19 page. You know, these are different outlines and we're looking at documents that are just sort of moments in time. They are not the definitive statement. The, the screenplay is never a definitive statement. Uh, certainly an unproduced screenplay is not a, a definitive statement. It's just a thought that they're having that they're exploring. And so, you know, with, with, with non the, the security robot, they, they never, to date, they haven't done it. You know, they, it was just an idea that they were saying, what if, let's, let's try this as a, as a concept. We're, we're just, it's just words on paper. Let's figure out how far can we push this so that it's in keeping with what's going on in cinema at the time or technology at the time. But they didn't do it, you know. And even if they did do it, I don't think it would have necessarily been as crazy as it sounds. And it does sound like an over-the-top idea where I think, like, with I think they would have sort of, they would have laid the groundwork that that Nan was a robot, a security an android whatever and then but they would never and they would have had that moment where they're facing off and there would have been the reveal it's like oh my gosh the the, the security breastworks is is sort of how it's described and you would have gotten the thrill of saying oh look at the robot but they would have let it be it's like with baron samity at the end of live and let die that character died Mm. there's a supernatural element in live and let die that is unexplained that character died and came back and we just go, oh, that's just like a little weird thing. And I think that's, that was the idea. And I'm not saying it would have worked or wouldn't have worked. I'm saying that was the, arguably, the artistic thought behind it. Like if, if, um, 
Dave Bautista's character came back in the next movie, and I have no idea if, if they do. So don't, so please don't say anything. <laughs> but um, that's what it had been. We, we, we saw it you know, go, go, go off the train, and we assumed dead, but not necessarily. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point and a, and a hopeful point as well. Because I suppose you do have those things, like those, there are ideas that they almost did in the past, which then do come back. You know, famously, one of my favorites is when they're talking about the, the different hitmen in, uh, in Daylights and they talk about the lady who likes to squeeze people with their thighs and all that kind of stuff. And then obviously Xenia becomes that in a few films time. You know, there's just those little nuggets of ideas. And I suppose there with that idea of, uh, Tim's Bond being a little past his prime or whatever and struggling to, to catch up. I mean, that that's Skyfall, isn't it? That's precisely, you know, he's off his game and all the rest of it. And 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 there's that whole sequence where he's training and all that kind of business. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting to see those little kernels of an idea kind of come back or not. So what, what would you say, like, with all these different kind of versions of, of Tim's third film, like, where where did that sort of stop what derailed like where do, do you know where that point where it's like you know what let's scrap the robot thing and let's go over here where that where that well, yeah and, and the robot the robot idea does not carry over to the to this to the set to the to the osborne draft of of so it was it, it only stopped it was only that first iteration it, was, it did not carry over to the second iteration mm -hmm. and then why didn't dalton do a third one it was just all the you know the legal it was not as 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 most bond fans know the reason that there wasn't a third dalton film immediately afterwards it was not because of the disappointing returns of uh uh license to kill it was just all that legal problems that prevented the next film from going into production and they had so much confidence in dalton in that they started drafting a fourth film uh, that was written for dalton and that was called uh reunion with death so we could have gotten at least four Dalton. I mean, it, and that's sort of the, what's sad about it is because Dal Dalton was a great Bond, but he, 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 the, Dalton as Bond hasn't been like sort of congealed in the public consciousness. Mm. It, he, he's, he's almost the other fella. You know, Lazenby's Bond has, has risen up, uh, but Dalton was sort of like a, to the public sort of a weird failed experiment. And I think having a third film would have just stamped him in the public's consciousness more. Yeah, I think, did, did you ever see that comedy called I Love You Man? It was like, came out maybe yeah, yeah. years ago. Timothy Dalton got a, a name check in that. And I remember almost like spitting my, my tea out when I was watching it, because there's a scene where they go suit shopping. And he, and he puts on, you know, the suit and the tie and all the rest of it. Um, I forget the dude's name now, but he, you know, um, Jason Segel was it? Jason Segel and the, and the other oh, dude, like, oh, yeah. yeah, that's the dude. He stood there and he's, he's got the tux on and all the rest of it. And he's like, I don't know if I can carry it off. And he's like, come on, think, think James Bond, think, think Timothy Dalton. And I was like, holy shit. I would like, that's the one, like I, out of, uh, with the exception of probably George, like I would have thought they would have at least name checked Sean, Roger or whoever, you know what I mean? The big ones, but to, to see Timothy get a shout out was, was, was a nice little touch. Cause you're absolutely right. Of course, man. He's, he's the, I would say he's among a, a lot of people. He's the bond fans bond, isn't he? You know what I mean? The, the ones who are bang into the books and stuff do tend to, to love a bit of Dalton. So, so yeah, it's that thing. I always say that you need, it's typically that third film. That's the one that really sets them on fire. Isn't it? It's the, you know, your gold finger, it's your spy love me. It's your skyfall. It's that third film. And he was just like, it just didn't quite happen. And I, I often wonder what, what history would look like had that third film happened. And it, that might've, like you say, it's that thing where he sort of, sort of was doing okay with, in terms of the whole public perception of him with, with daylights and, and license to kill less so with License to Kill, obviously, but maybe that third one would have been the spark that boom, you know, and made him massive. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting thought. Yeah. yeah, now I think the surprising thing, because I mean, considering how we, we know that Ian kind of works now is that, you know, things take a long time. Obviously there's a long gap between the films now and, um, you know, they don't seem to be going, thinking beyond the next film in terms of, um, uh, you know, uh, continuing like an overarching story. So the one thing that surprised me a bit when I was reading your book is uh, also that they had uh, that fourth film. Um, they had at least hired someone to to start writing a treatment for the for, for a fourth film before even 
having you know uh, said about the third film. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. So you know, Bond fans are always not always Bond friends fans frequently want films at a more regular pace. Why don't we get them like we did in the sixties and seventies? Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. You know, films are bigger; they take a lot longer to make, and blah blah blah. But they, in this period of time, while they were still writing Bond 17, they were thinking about Dalton's fourth film. And they had two tracks that they were pursuing. John Cork, who is, you know, one of the, you know, he, he's a very respected Bondologist. Uh, he was working on a series of outlines and pitches. None of them were uh, accepted. And uh, Richard Smith, also uh, wrote a, 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 an outline called uh, Reunion with Death. Uh, now, I knew that Richard Smith um, wrote, some, wrote a St Sylvester Stallone film called Lock, Lock Up. Is that right? Yes. I feel right. like that's right. It's yeah, the, I think that's right. Yeah. And so I, was, I wanted to get in touch with him, but Richard Smith is a very common name. <laughs> And the Variety article in 1993 or so that announced Richard Smith writing Bond as one of the possible writers of Bond 18 uh, said that he was also a actor, makeup artist, and producer. So I contacted as many Richard Smiths who are writers or actors or makeup artists or producers, like a <laughs> lunatic looking for Richard Smith. And then I would always get an email back saying, no, I'm not that Richard Smith. Um, so uh, this, it just, this is just to highlight how difficult it is to sometimes just uncover any information about this stuff. Because sometimes the source material that you're drawing from has inaccurate information. Anyway, I finally uh, found him. He, he has since passed away, uh, but, but his widow was kind enough to share his work with me. And, uh, and was kind enough to allow me to quote from it. So in that chapter on Reunion with Death, uh, I go into all the details of that Bond film that would have taken place in Japan. It was, it was great. I, 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 it was a, would have been a great s story. Uh, uh, it ends sort of on a, sa on a somber note with Bond at a, at a cemetery with cherry blossoms falling all over the place. And, and Pat did this wonderful, illustration to show you what it would have been like. It was just moody and wistful and and it had uh, Tiger Tanaka's son, uh, takes place in Japan. Um, really cool stuff. Oh, oh, no, what it had also? Cool. It had, um, it was like almost like the start of Moonraker in that his secretary was there, whose name, I'm just gonna call her Lil because I can't say Le Leola Panis be correct. <laughs> 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 It, 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 it had her, it had his sort of the drudgery of being, you know, uh, the, the, the Moonraker drudgery of being a spy, which is yeah, paperwork and fun trying to avoid it. It was great stuff. Whoa, that sounds intriguing. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Big time. Tiger Tanaka's son. That's a, that's a, I, again, I don't quite know how I feel about that. It's, I suppose it's, you, you get Quarrel Jr. and Live and Let Die, don't you? So that's, yeah, right. you know, I, I've always been okay with that. Yeah, it's, I suppose it's a, it's a, it's a tricky one. I suppose it all depends on how it's done at the end of the yeah. day, is how they, how they portray it on screen. And it, oh, I'm sorry. And it also had M wounded, uh, nearly, M gets hurt, you know, nearly mortally, doesn't die, um, but near, gets, you know, really hurt. And it was a way, his effort to bring in M in a way that would later be reflected in these, in these Brosnan and, and, and Craig films, where, where M became a more central character. And of course, M was a big character in uh, Colonel Sun, but he, he, he was doing that before Whoa. Brosnan and Craig. That's cool. Yeah. I'm sorry, Tom, I interrupted you. What were you No, no worries, man. I was just going to say, I, I, one thing I, I find intriguing is that uh, I think it was a 1985 script Richard Maybaum and Michael G. Wilson wrote about the, or an idea at least, of the origin story for The Living mm -hmm. Daylights. Now, is it for, two questions, basically. Number one is kind of what vibe was that going to be? And number two, is there any kernels of ideas that became 
casino later on down the line. Yes. Mm-hmm. So when an, another iteration of Dalton's third bond, oh no, excuse me. No, no, I, I take it back. What, this could have been Dalton's first bond. Right. And it would have been a James Bond origin story. And the, the first part would have had sort of a young, reckless Bond who is like an attache for an ambassador. He gets caught in a little scandal. Uh, he, he's sort of rudderless. He, you know, he plays cards and hangs around with women, but he's not, he's, he's, he doesn't have that clear goal. M, uh, I almost spoiled something. Um, he, and so he doesn't have that clear goal. He goes to uh, uh, Anne, Char- Anne Charmaine. Is that how you say it? I'm so bad at saying these things. Charmaine, oh, yeah, from the books. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, he was raised yeah. by his Aunt Charmaine. She's there, she gives him a hug. Um, and then we meet Bond's grandfather who gives him some direction and sets him up with M at, at, at Blades. Um, and it then it gets paired off with a senior uh, eight double O agent who shows him the ropes. And it's a real mentor relationship where you learn how Bond learns the value of talking, learn, you know, you know, he learns the value of trying not to fall in love in a, on a mission, which he does in this origin story. Um, See, that's interesting there. Cause I, I remember, I, th- I think it was Golden Eye, wasn't it? Wasn't that one of the early ideas for 006, that 006 was an older agent that was going to almost be a mentor to Bond? Yeah. Yes. It's uh, interesting yeah. to yeah. see. Yeah. Yeah. And, then, and then in this iteration, uh, yeah, the 00 agent um, turns out to be you know, uh, 007, uh, who named Trevor, and he, um, yeah, at the end, of, obviously he dies uh, throughout the, in the mission, and then at the end of the, the story, Bond takes over that. He actually requests that he be, that he take the 007 as a, like a tribute to this agent who was his mentor. Um, so that, that I mean that that I found I found interesting too about the, this iteration of uh, and it would have been called the Living Daylights. I think there would have been a line uh, where um, someone said, "Oh, you know, you knocked the Living Daylights out of that guy or something, something yeah, like it, that." It, yeah, I, I do. I do strongly suspect. Jack's one hundred percent accurate. I do strongly suspect that that would have also been called the Living Daylights for the reason Jack just said. And then in another draft, they said, "Oh, let's do the Living Daylights torture." So they had they knew they liked this title. And they were just trying to figure out how, how do you work it in. Uh, and that one would have also ended with Bond going on an assignment, like, oh, let's send him to Jamaica and investigate Dr. No, or, or, or something. Right, yeah. I don't think you would have liked that, Bond. <laughs> <laughs> so that would have firmly established this as the adventure before Dr. No. But then it's like, well, what do you do After. From yeah. there? Is Dalton's second film but between that, or does you jump ahead to after a view to a kill? You know, it just there's a lot of way, reasons not to be that linear or do that much. Yeah, and it would have been a period piece. Like the film would have been made around the time Living Daylights was made, but it would have taken place in the '70s. And so, you know, what would you do with the next film? Would you jump ahead to like the '80s? And you know, Dalton would presumably. Bond would be a decade older, but Dalton wouldn't have aged. So it was, it, it would have been a, a very uh, kind of messy thing to have, you know, pursued if they, if they had gone there. Right. It would have been messy in terms of the larger implications of the series, but the story itself and their approach was just so strong. You know, this is the thing where I was like, there's a 30, 30 55 page treatment, a 19 page, a 15, and then there's notes and there's all these great ideas. And this was written by uh, Maybaum and Wilson, uh, who, who know Bond better than most. And, um, you know, but, and sometimes you'll see small errors, like Maybaum spells blades wrong in his, in, in his, on his typewriter, uh, or he'll reference the, you'll, you've had your six shots or whatever it is from Dr. No, and he'll, he'll refer to for, From Rush With Love. And it's interesting to see, and Maybaum is steeped in, 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 in Bond. I mean, he he's really working with the the source material in a way he has a strong familiarity so it's sort of comforting to see as 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 a writer who will sometimes refer to the wrong bond movie but it's like if maybaum occasionally makes a mistake it, it's it's okay for us mere mortal to, now, to give it a shot no maybaum sorry <laughs> here you go jack but maybaum's um uh, uh, his archives are in the university of iowa did you go there and um is that where you found 
yes, that's where that's that yeah that's where that's where the the bulk of this material was from okay. um and then so one thing i want to say about they didn't do it obviously um and there and you know we just talked about some of the implications but some of these ideas uh, oh, oh so broccoli said audiences want to see a bond who is in total command of his powers they don't want to see a novice bond but which is which is a it's a it's hard to argue with that but but they sort of solved that for casino royale they made that a origin story so what they did and what by not dim, diminishing the character is bond in casino royale is a, a very skilled operative but he is sort of still a work in progress internally and emotionally so they found a way in these in, in Casino Royale to address Broccoli's major note in a satisfying way. So I, I thought that was and still provide this essence of the story. Yeah, I th I think they played that just right in the sense that you don't want to see this sort of bumbling, clumsy Bond, do you? You know what I mean? You, you don't want to see him whip his gun out and drop it on the floor and be like, oh, I'm gonna have to stoop and pick it up. You don't ever want to see that. What I like about that is just sort of like how, like you say, yeah, emotionally, and then just sort of how he was a bit more reckless than perhaps he should be going into the embassy at the beginning and stuff like that, that perhaps an older agent would would shy away from. I don't know, Bond's always a bit reckless, isn't he? But I I, I, I really do like how they, uh, how they nailed that for sure. Um, so let me ask you this, man. Um, back in the Spy Who Loved Me days, John Landis, talk to me about that. So John Landis has two Bond eras to discuss. There's the Spy Who Loved Me days when he, he was hanging out at, at, at the, at, at, in London at the studios and, and was really welcomed by Broccoli uh, into the fold. You know, it was, if it was cold, Broccoli would get him, you know, this nice coat. They'd take him shopping. Then he'd introduce to royalty. He really just welcome him into the fold. And then one of the nice things about the Alphonse interview is Alphonse was talking about how he, Michael G. Wilson never tre treated him like a neophyte writer in the world of Bond. They would, uh, you know, they would make bread together and go on walks and he treated him with great deference and respect. Mm -hmm. And that's how Landis felt uh, working on The Spy Who Loved Me back in the 70s. Uh, but, uh, so he would he'd come up with all these ideas and he had a, a pre-title sequence where he wanted to see Roger more uh, just battered and bruised and bloody. And that was his sort of main goal. He's like, we always see Roger more. He's always impeccable. He's always impeccable. There's never a hair out of place. I want to start with him at, at his worst. And Pat also drew an illustration to, to help us, us readers imagine what that would be like. Um, and then the other period that, um, I'll just take a break. I, sorry, I just talk so much. I'm not. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. Well, here's that picture. Uh, I don't know if you can see it from my phone. I kind of, uh, it's, it might be a little bright, but it's, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it's, it, I don't know if you can see it from, yeah. You can but just then, not make out as Roger, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so the, then the other, and so his idea, ideas didn't go anywhere, and he never really felt like we were making the movie. And when Guy Hamilton left the picture, he did too. But he talks in detail about sort of the experience of, hanging out there and trying to come up with uh, for Bond, uh, for Spy Who Loved Me. And then the other period he, he that's interesting is he said that uh, Broccoli offered him license to kill, uh, to direct it. And, I, and he didn't do it because at that point he had earned final cut and you, the ability to control your picture and release the one, the version of your film that you want, which is yeah. very important. And he didn't want to give that up. And looking back, he realized that uh, I should have, I would have been in good hands with Broccoli. I, I should have given it a shot. Interesting. Yeah, that's another great, great one. Because he's a legend, isn't he, John Landis, or was, I should say. But yeah, that, that's another one that could set your imagination on fire, couldn't it? Imagining what that would have been like. Spy Love Me and License to Kill, two drastically different films. So we would have, yeah, it would have been interesting to see what his take on, on either one of those would have been. But yeah, what, a, what an absolute legend. Now, going similar kind of uh, time there, you have a, a Moonraker treatment as well that you talk about in the book. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so Carrie Bates is a comic book writer, and he's often 
credited with being one of the dozen writers on, on The Spy Who Loved Me. Uh, but in truth, he was writing uh, a, a version of Moonraker. So that, that was one of the sort of myths that I helped clear up in the book. He's like, no, it was Moonraker. There was a, su there was a submarine element in it. Uh, and hiding like a sub in Loch Ness. Um, mm -hmm. And so he said, well, that's why sometimes people think it's Spy Who Loved Me and ultimately why they didn't use my version because there, there was an element uh, that was similar. Uh, but he talked about, you know, having twins, Pluto and Plato, P-L-A-T-O, mm -hmm. uh, two, you know, uh, two assassin twins that, we, that, that, would, that idea would carry over. We, we would see that late in, in later Bond yeah. films. Yeah, Mishka and Grishka, of course, yeah. Interesting. Oh, and that would have had um, uh, the return of, uh, you're not going to like this, uh, From Russia With Love, uh, TR. Uh, That's the only rumor on the one. Thank you. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Coming back in Moonraker, that is, see, I suppose the thing with that is, is that's something they've toyed around with a lot, isn't it? There's been a lot of times where they've thought, let's bring a Bond girl back from the past. So it's like with Polar Ivanova, they toyed with that being Triple X coming back. They toyed with bringing Wylin back in Die Another Day. You know, there's always been these things of let's bring a past Bond girl back. And I, oh man, I don't know how I feel about it, especially when it's a, a crossover between different Bond actors as well. That just, can you imagine, say, I don't know, well, stick with, with Tatiana, I suppose. Tatiana hanging out with Roger or hanging out with Tim, it would just feel strange, wouldn't it? it, it on some level, if it was still Sean, I feel like, okay, on some level, but I don't know. How do you feel about that, Mark? Do you think that's a, that's a no-go zone or what? Yeah, I think, I think, I think that as as Bond fans, it's fun to see connections, but you're just, you can't recycle the past in, in a, you, you can only move forward. And, you know, although it's fun to read about, and there, there was a Bond comic, uh, which we could get to later, that Dark Horse had, where, where, they, where they, the writer did have uh, her return in for an adventure and i think that that can work for a book or a comic or a radio drama or a video game but i think let's let's otherwise you you, you become otherwise you're closing the story elements by reflecting back on what's already happened and it's just better to to go forward and i, I and i've only come to this in the last couple of years i think if you were to ask me this four years ago i would have enjoyed see, seeing it reflect back on itself but i think i don't think that's the way to go i think i think it would just be weird because if you take some say triple x if if that if polar even over had been triple x i think the weird thing about that is that triple x was such a massive feature of spy love me if she was just in and out of the of a view to a kill like that it would almost be like i want to see i want to see more of that it does she it feels like she deserves more than just a cameo you know what i mean and i think that's and also Man, these films belong so to the times in which they're made. I don't want to see what Pussy Galore would be like in 1979 because she's immortal in 64. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't want to see her 15 years later. I don't want to see any of those later on. You know what I mean? It just doesn't feel... Yeah, yeah no, there, it, there's no reason to. And with Tomorrow Never Dies, they, you know, they said, oh, pa pa Pam Carver, she, she had a relationship with Bond. And you, you, can, you could get into that or, 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 or in Goldeneye you know, yeah. 006, you know, they were buddies. And we get that from the way that they interact. We don't need to have seen that actual character in a previous film. Yeah. You could just, it's, all these things happen off camera. I'm sorry, what you can say, Jack? No, speaking of Tomorrow Never Dies, um, I mean, it, it, I mean, it's not really elaborated, but uh, there was that, there was talk at least of a Dr. Kaufman spinoff movie. Um, it didn't get beyond, obviously, the, 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 initial stages of, you know, just the initial conversation. But uh, what would that have been like? I mean, a, a Dr. Kaufman kind of prequel, I guess, uh, prior to him encountering Bond. Yeah, one of the revelations <laughs> in the book is that the, the, these two spinoff ideas for the Brosnan era, including, you know, that, that, char that, that character from Tomorrow uh, Never Dies, yeah. who I loved. I think that was a, a, a great, it was a great scene. Yeah. N not meant to be. That, that is a very strange concept, isn't it? Like if, if you're going to do a Bond <laughs> spin-off, 
Dr. Kaufman, I mean, that's a, that's a, that is an unusual choice, isn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah, we, I guess it would have, the, the, it would have ended with him going off to kill Eris Carver and, you know, um, and I guess uh, Brosnan would have had a cameo at some point too. And they were also discussing a Wei Lin, uh, like a spinoff series. And this is prior, because I know we all know the story about the, the Purvis and Wade were writing a, a Jinx spinoff, um, at, you know, after Die Another Day that never materialized. But, uh, but they had started thinking about sort of expanding the Bond universe uh, way back, you know, you know before that with, uh, with Wei Lin. Um, which uh, which would I, I would have been interesting just to see, and obviously if they had done a Wayland series of films, or uh, Brosnan would have appeared in them, and we would have had more Brosnan, uh, you know. Um, so it was, it, it, it was a lot, yeah, the what ifs, uh, you know, as Tom said, it, it's just one of those things that you know it just sort of sparks the imagination, like you know, what right. could have been. Dude, tell me about these artists you've been working with on this book because I I I, I keep an eye on on the uh, the JBR Twitter from time to time, and there is some magnificent pieces of fan artwork being thrown around these days. When I say magnificent, I mean like borderline genius Bond artwork being thrown around on Twitter these days. Um, and you know, not to be mean about it, but when we look at the official output in the last sort of decade or two it's you know a little bit lacking one might say so talk to me about the the fellows you work with i love J james bond art i'm you know uh you know the other book had, had interviews with artists you know who did like dan guzzi who did moonraker and um you know the, the classic bond art the the painted art is is what i grew up on and what i finally remember and like a lot of fans i've resisted photo art, although the, the Casino Royale photo uh, of him at the poker table is, mm. is, is, is spot on and as good yeah. as anything. Love that. Uh, but I have a, a folder on my phone and on my computer of all this Bond fan art, and I'm, and I'm a fan of it, and I follow all these artists. And Pat, uh, who did the illustrations for my first book, did you know, all these wonderful illustrations for this one. Uh, you know, one of the original ideas for James Bond Jr., was to have an opening gun barrel sequence like the movies, which they didn't do uh, in the in the show. But uh, Pat illustrated it to help viewers imagine what that would have been like. Or there's a a, a dog a, a dog fight with um, a paraglider dog fight in one of the Dalton versions, and so he also illustrated that. You know, he he illustrated all these wonderful moments that either were or could have been. Mm -hmm. And then Sean did these two wonderful covers. Um, and so both of these guys are just people whose work I, I admire and was very grateful that they contributed to the book. And did, did you have like a, a set sort of vision of, of how you wanted that artwork to be done? Or did you say, just go and do this and give no, me a No, it, it was Sean and the book cover. So the book covers are so difficult because you're, you, they people do judge a book by its cover and the book cover tells you what the book's about for my first book uh the many lives of james bond people were upset i that david niven was on it how are you going to have david niven when you're not having dalton or lazenby mm. and, and and i as a dalton and lazenby enthusiast i get the idea in this case, the idea was to signal to people that this is not just about the Eon Bonds. It's gonna be, uh, I'm gonna interview Bonds in video games, radio dramas, and uh, television, all that stuff. Yeah. The dancing Bond from the Oscars. So, but that didn't, so, but somehow that didn't, that, this didn't convey all that to people. And some of the people are like, I'm not buying the book because Dalton's not on the cover. Good job. Um, which, which I was like, oh no, please just take a look. Um, <laughs> so on the next book, you're like, right, let's have in front so, of you. <laughs> so I was like, well, we got, I said, so it was, so, it was something, and Jack knows that I was just, uh, you know, just thinking about and thinking about and thinking about. And so once I started, once Sean uh, agreed to do the cover, we had, Sean and I had a lot of discussions about what do we do? Now, when you're doing a Bond book, you could put, a silhouette of James Bond, and everyone's going to know. But there's so many Bond books with silhouettes. So, so many Bond books that I own. I'm not that I, I that is like. Well, you, we could do that. That that would totally be great, and that will convey James Bond. Or you could take an image of a James Bond actor. 
But if you do take an image of a James Bond actor, you're either taking the actor of record, in this case, Daniel Craig, or you go to the first one, Sean Connery, and either of those sort of represents all Bonds, mm. or you do one of those things where it's, you know, all six Eon Bonds. Um, but Dalton was really the focus, uh, is one of the, the, the book is 425 pages long, and there's only like 80 or 100 pages on Dalton, so he's not everything. But he is a big focus of the book, and that was one way to signal to the, the to Bond fans that this is, Dal that this is that this book dives into Dalton a lot. But at the same time, I was worried that if Dalton's on the cover, that ge the general public, who are not Bond fanatics, would not understand what the book was about. Mm -hmm. Although I think this, I think. I don't know if you're if you're if you have a minor interest in Bond. If, if this book, I shouldn't say that. But even if you have a minor interest in Bond, this book is certainly for you. you, you no, I mean, this for book, everyone, even if yeah, you like Bond, everyone should read. Get a copy. No, I mean this book oh, goes, like deep dive. This book sort of assumes that you've read all those other books. Yeah. You know, you know, this book assumes you're a next level Bond fan. Anyway, so the other way to signal to uh, an audience that this book is about Bond is to have a Bond, a, a symbol of Bond, you know, a martini glass or a gun. And, you know, and so he, he picked the, 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 the Beretta, I'm, I'm told, oh, excuse me, the Walter PPK. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea, and then he came up with this idea of, you know, it's like this idea of the Thanos snap where you see something disappear. And he came up with the idea of how to, how to, how to make that happen where you could see sort of see, Dalton disappearing, or you could see the pages come out of the gun. So it, it, it's like, how do you show something that's disappearing? Yeah. You can't have an empty gun barrel. And it also has to be simple enough that an audience member or a potential reader on their phone could see the little postage side stamp when they're scrolling through Amazon. So th this, this is so complicated to come up with a book cover. Dude, it's a tricky thing, isn't it? Marketing it just in the right way. I, what I will say to anybody listening who thinks that they shouldn't get the many lives of James Bond because Dalton's not on the cover, um, don't be on my pit. Go and get copy because it's really good. <laughs> it's, it's as simple as that. Yeah, it's it. Don't like I often say. Every there are a million books out there about Bond, aren't there? If you were to go to the the Bond book library, there's a million things that you could read about the films and all sorts of stuff going on. And it's it's rare that one comes along that you're like. Oh, I you need that one because it's got some new stuff in there, and that's definitely what the many lives of James Bond is, and it's definitely what this one is too. So it's 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 that thing. So don't obviously be put off by David Niven because that's just silly talk as far as I'm concerned. But uh, but there we go. Now, um, Jack, you had a question about um, Casino Royale, the live stage play, didn't you? Yes, uh, yeah. One of your interviews is with Raymond Benson, who you know was a guest, an early guest on JVR, and uh, you know who wrote the continuation novels famously. Uh, so um, he wrote a stage play. So when did this come about? And uh, I think your book goes into some details as about how it would be staged, uh, how what his vision for it would have been. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So uh, Raymond Benson had this idea, which is, could we do? Bond as a stage play. And he pitched it to the Ian Fleming Foundation, although it's called, I think it's called Glyn Rosa at, at that moment. And they said, hmm, that sounds like a great idea. Go, go write it. And he thought that Casino Royale would be the, the only one that could work, which was coincidentally also the, the, the ones that the Fleming Foundation had the rights to make as a stage play. So he wrote, uh, he describes, you know, his process of writing it and, and what it would look like. And uh, it probably is, given its nature, the, the only one that could work as a stage play. If you've seen the 1954 uh, uh, television show, you, you see how, it's an in, how it, it can be done as an intimate story. And, you know, there would be fights on stage, there a limited number of characters, and he let me include his playbill from the stage reading. And so one thing about that is that in the appendix of this book, I try to list all actors who have played James Bond in film, television, radio, video games, um, commercials. Like, you know, if there's a Casino Royale commercial where um, 
Eva Green comes in and she says, you know, oh, James, I've got the whatever. And he says, oh, just put it over there. Or so, you know, I'm, that's not right. But that's an actor who's played James Bond. Mm -hmm. um, so I tried to come up with a list and, I've, and I named about 34 actors who played James Bond in the appendix as some sort of weird little treat. Um, anyway, uh, so he talked about the process of, of writing the play and it ultimately didn't work. Uh, well, excuse me, it ultimately didn't go forward. It's not that it didn't work. Mm -hmm. It ultimately didn't go forward. But uh, it would have been, it's an interesting what if, a Raymond Benson, James Bond play. And Benson, you know, he, you know, he wrote six novels, three novelizations, three short stories, video games, and the James Bond bedside companion. You know, this guy knows his Bond. It, 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 you know, it certainly would have been interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I do wonder what that would be be like because i remember a few years ago i think i think it might have been a massive flop actually but there was a huge broadway spider-man musical wasn't yes. it yes yeah and there was just seemed to be a curse from start to finish with all sorts going wrong with it and i've often wondered what what i mean and like you said there mark that that original um stage tv production of of casino royale would probably be somewhat like it but i've always i've often wondered what a, a live stage bond production might might look like yeah that would, that would make an interesting read so mark then last couple of questions um firstly what would you say in in the time of writing this book what is your personal favorite little unmade lost bond thing that you discovered uh i don't i i don't know if i have a favorite i the one of the, so james bond radio did an interview with Alan J. Porter, who talked about that there's more Bond stories in comic book form than there are in any other form, films and novels combined. And so it got me, uh, I don't know if you've ever listened to that, um, but it, it, got me, it got me wondering about all these uh, lost comics. And I, Zigzag, this Ch Chilean publisher, did 59 original Bond stories. And German G-A-B-L-E-R did, um, wrote most of them and illustrated many of them. And these are wonderful stories that are both, some of them are faithful adaptations of the novels, Fleming's novels and short stories, but some of them are also original stories. And some of those original stories are just far out. There's one where Bond meets his gang of women who wear bee costumes and fly around in jetpacks. There's another one where Bond battles a Yeti, which is like a Bigfoot creature. Yeah. And there's another one where Bond goes surfing. And the person that- I the, like that one. <laughs> Sean Connery, it's Sean Connery's likeness. So you see Sean Connery in, 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 in adventures that you associate with Roger Moore, like Sean Connery and Moonraker. But you also see Sean Connery surfing. And it's just, you see Sean Connery battling a Yeti. You know, it's great, great stuff. Uh, but because it's, in, it's out of print and in Spanish, a lot of us fans didn't know about it. Yeah. And there's also, um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's one really cool one. Another thing is um, the, there were all these Dark Horse comics of the 80s that were, were incomplete where only two out of the four planned issues were uh, printed. And so I tracked down the, 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 the writer and the artist and they, uh, I published the, the, out, the treatments for issues three and four so fans could see how they ended. Mm -hmm. Or there, in one of the comics, there's a line like, oh, the good work 007, your mission's over. And it's sort of an, an illusion that the villain is still at large. So I would reach out to the writer and say, is that a whole other story? And they, you know, they said yes. And then they would tell me the sequel to that. And they're also, um, I'm just, we're, we're, we're wrapping up. Is that it? So I'll just go through these quickly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we can be as long as you like, man. It's all good. No, no, in any rush. And, and so um, there's also these James Bond choose your own adventure stories. And what I love about these is that Bond dies in them. So, you know, you, you know these choose of your adventure. If, if Bond yeah. should stay and fight, turn to page 44. If he, should, if he should run away, turn to page 77. So if you make the wrong choice, Bond dies. And it's so interesting to see a Bond story where 
where, where Bond dies at the end. Mm. Um, and uh, R.L. Stein, who um, wrote Goosebumps, he was one of the writers on one of these. And they, these were four uh, Choose Your Own Adventure stories that came out during the Roger Moore era. Three are closely tied to the plot elements of A View to a Kill, but the other one is sort of a, a completely original story. And so that's a lot of fun. Interesting. And then, and then I also went into James Bond Jr. Yes. Um, I, I, mean, I, was gonna, I was gonna ask you about that because a lot of fans, when you mention James Bond Jr., the cartoon, um, they'll they'll obviously, you know, sort of dismiss it and and you wanna pretend that it doesn't exist. But your book focuses a lot on it. And um, I think it's important because Elon put in a lot of work into the creation of it, and there was a lot of thought that goes in that went into it. And I feel like um, you can learn a, a lot, uh, even if you don't particularly care for the series, for the cartoon series itself. You can learn a lot about what the, the behind the scenes at Eon um, by finding out about the the creative process behind it. So, can you tell us a little bit about what you discover there? Yeah, I, I completely agree. Uh, you know, I, I write that Bond fans don't agree on much, but they agree that James Bond Jr. Is, isn't the best thing ever. But the people who worked on it... <laughs> that, was a, uh, that was a lovely way of putting it. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the best thing ever. But, yeah, go on, Gary. But, I, 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 I mean, I probably have written the most definitive account on James Bond Jr. because I've been fascinated by this show. It's just, like, what... I really wanted to know what, what what were they thinking? What was their intention of taking this adult character and 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 shaping him into a cartoon for for kids? And so I interviewed the co and Michael G. Wilson was a co-creator on this. Uh, so I interviewed the co-creator, a the co-director, uh, like seven or eight writers, and the and the guy who wrote the 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 lyrics. Um, and if you look at the James Bond Jr. Bible, a Bible is a document that writers and that everyone uses so that they're all on the same page about a show. And it, it tells you who all the characters are and, and what, what makes them tick. And the Bible for the show is revealing, even though they're writing about James Bond Jr., it's revealing, it reveals information about James Bond. So their approach to James Bond Jr. and what drives him and what motivates him is the same things as what motivates James Bond. How the writers say you should use a gadget in James Bond Jr. is the same way that they would use a gadget in the films. So it's, it's a re very revealing look at the creative process and what, they were, what their original intentions were and what they kept and what they didn't and, and why they did. And, um, yeah, I mean, there was spin-off novels, there was toys. It was a huge effort. This wasn't a knockaway thing that, 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 that they were doing. They put all their cards at that, at that moment in time into this project. That's interesting stuff, and I, 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 have a, I might be wrong, but I have a vague memory that wasn't it wasn't Kevin McClory going to start a, an animated Bond series, and that was their answer to it, or something? They yeah, the, the, I mean, the, there was a yeah, there there is that rumor that he was going to do his animated series, and this is, was their answer to that. It was also sort of a fallow period where the films weren't happening, and it's a way to keep the character in the public eye and then introduce him to a new generation of fans and you do with some of that these days. Yeah. Really you see that with like Marvel, will they'll, 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 they'll scale up and down the kinds of stories that they tell depending on what age demographic. So you could see like little baby Hulk, you know, doing his thing. And sorry for the little dance there. Mm -hmm. But um, so, so that, you know, they're, they're, you, you could see their thinking, whether you think they're successful or, and this is the thing about the book is it's, um, it's not whether something, or, or even the other book, it's not whether something is good or bad. It's, 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 it's an attempt to understand the creative process and what they were thinking. And you, you don't like the idea that's, that's totally good. I'm not trying to convince you it's a good show or it's a bad show. I'm just saying this was their approach to it and this is their effort. And as well, with that said, it, it, it's, it's in, interesting because it's a part of Bond history, isn't it? It's like even when they do something absolutely outrageous and bananas, like I think there's a, I think I remember Alan J. Porter telling us there was, a, there was a one where Bond faced off against dinosaurs even in, in one of the comics. Yeah, yeah, Serpent's Tooth, yeah. Yeah, it's just absolute bananas, crazy stuff. But it just that's interesting to learn about 
anyway, isn't it? You know what I mean? Well, um, yeah. and, and, and it's not available on DVD. It's not available on Blu-ray. You can't stream it. And so with all these stories, and I don't know how many I cover, I, I'm going to make up a number 40, 40 different stories in, in, in radio. They're not about, they're not, they're out of print. They're unmade. They're not, I mean, you go on Amazon and find them. I did, you know, but you have to really seek them out. Mm. Uh, and it's, you know, so that, that's it. You have to seek them out and they, because they're not commercially or easily commercially available, uh, they're not always part of the conversation, but, but, they're a thing and they should be. Yeah. yeah. I mean, one of the things that you talk about too, is that um, it, the show obviously ended up being very light, but when they were developing it, um, when they developed the show Bible, they were, there was potential there uh, because obviously uh, the, the, the James Bond Jr. His kind of story mirrors Bond. So his parents are missing and abducted uh, so that it, there was potential there to kind of make it more of a serious show, but they, they kind of veered away from that. But it, it's interesting when, the, you know, those initial discussions that they were having and what the, the work that went into creating the Bible, the show Bible, um, it's interesting to sort of see what the thought process was. Yeah, they, they had an idea where Bond would uh, occasionally, that, that James Bond Jr. was trying to find his parents who were kidnapped and an early idea was that uh, James Bond would occasionally show up on the scene. And so that means that they would, have ha they would have cast an actor who would have played James Bond, who I would have had to seek out and ask a lot of silly questions. Uh, so I'm sorry that that didn't come to pass because I really wanted to ask them a lot of silly questions. And the thing about these James Bond Jr. Uh, like tie-ins and novelizations is they weren't supposed to include James Bond in them but some of them do because the writer didn't know that they weren't supposed to. So in, in some, he appears, you know, like in a cable or, a, a, you know, telefax. Um, but in another, or, but in another, uh, I think it's, he appears in person, I think twice. So there's a James Bond story where James Bond, there's, is in it that we're not reading because it's out of print and because it says James Bond Jr. on it, but James Bond's there. That's it. That th there's a a great sort of throwback to to years gone before the internet became massive, whereby, back, for me back in the day it would be you know I'd go down the the record shop or whatever and I'd be leafing through CDs and if the shop didn't have that CD and I'd have to send away and order it and there's that feeling of discovery isn't there that you used to have whereas now you jump on Google or you're on Spotify and you can instantly get anything, that feeling of this this uh, for me. Uh, early on was uh, Colonel Sun. I could never find Colonel Sun anywhere and there was no way for me to get it. And then once upon a time, I went into this really nasty old secondhand bookshop on the Isle of Wight and there it was on the shelf. And it was like, <gasps> it was this magical moment and I had to buy it immediately. It cost me about a pound, I think. And then it ran home and immediately started reading it. And it was that feeling of discovery that you just don't get anymore. So it's, it's it, on, on the one hand, it's a shame that there's a lot of this stuff that, isn't readily readily available, but at the same time, there's almost like a romantic feeling with when you do discover those things, isn't it? That they're out there and and they're rare, you know. You know that's a great point, and that that's really there's all this. So we've we've all read the the novels, or seen the and seen the movies, but there's this whole all this bond out there that sort of can be new to many people uh, that there is there to discover. And that's, you know, one, I just hope that people will pick up the book and go, Oh yeah, I know I like the movies and the novels, but maybe I'll try out this other bond thing. Um, uh, let me say two more things and we, we, I, I, we call it a day or, um, one, uh, there's also, I also interviewed, uh, Toby Stevens, who is the radio bond and I've never, he's played, he's played bond eight times on the radio. I'm sure in early next year, there'll be a ninth. Uh, he's played Bond more times than Connery or more. Um, and That's so amazing. I never heard him properly interviewed about playing James Bond. Uh, so that, that was a thrill. And then the other thing I want to say is that, I'm going to take another drink of water, sorry. Yeah, no worry. I, d I don't mean to rush you at all. The only reason is I, 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 I want to make sure that you still keep some secrets in the book. Okay, I, no, I, I know you from last time, man. I can ask you one question and you'll talk for five hours about it. So it's, <laughs> it's just, I don't, I don't want you to give away everything in the book so people go and get it. You know what I mean? Uh, and then the, the last thing I'll say, which is not so much about the book, but just the process of writing a book. 
My name is on the book, but there's a lot of people who contributed to it. My uncle was a, a great advocate. Jack was an advocate, uh, you know, who would give me feedback. Uh, the, you know, you, you, you've inspired me. All these bondologists whose work I, I read. Uh, so I just wanted to say that this is a, a big team effort. Uh, my name gets to be on the, on the cover, but um, uh, it's, re it's really, this book exists because of a lot of people's efforts. Oh, well, that's a, that's a, that's a lovely thing to say. But what, what, what I will ask you, Mark, is this, I, I, I remember when we interviewed uh, Charles Helfenstein, who if for anybody that doesn't know, wrote the, the making of honor majesties and the making of living daylights, two essential bond books that, you know, uh, should be on the shelf next to yours. Um, and he says the curse of being a writer is that you spend a year or more writing a book and it's a lot of hard work and research and it, it really is a, a tough experience to, to, to deliver that finished product. And then when you do, you bring it out and then the first thing anybody says to you is, well, when's the next one coming out? So Mark Edlitz, is there going to be a third Bondian book from you? I don't know. I wasn't planning to write a, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm going to, probably not. I don't know. Just it's, it's, wink once if that's a code yes, and but you don't want to admit uh, it or what? <laughs> no, it's, it's, it, you know, these things take so long. Uh, this one was a hundred pages longer than the other one. Uh, you want to only deliver some, you know, so, sometimes I'll get an, uh, a, a, a Facebook message saying, why didn't you write about Goldfinger? Mm -hmm. And it's Goldfinger or whatever has been covered. And so I only wanted to write about something that, or these stories uh, that I felt like I could contribute something new to the conversation. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to regret, re it's based on a lot of research and, 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 and being informed by other people's writings, but I wanted to tell something new and add a new, add a new wrinkle to this bond discussion. Uh, so if I came up with something that was, you know, but I, I don't have any immediate plans. All right, cool. So. All right. Well, the nice thing I'll add yeah. to, to, to that is, you know, I remember when I was writing the first book, how sort of afraid I was of of, of the reception I would get, and, and and Bond fans who know much more than I do. Uh, but people have been what that was for the first book. For the second book, after I got the kind reception I have, and people who are welcoming me into the community. Uh, it was, this felt like something that I was much more excited to write and share with everyone because I knew that there was this sort of very generous community of, of, of Bond experts and Bond fans. Uh, so I, I was, it was, I'm, I'm thrilled to share this with them. Well, that's, that's a beautiful thing because I mean, at the end of the day, like I said earlier, there's a billion books out there about Bond that you can read and a lot of them, are, are, you know, they're just treading the same old ground that have been done a million times before. And then every so often one comes along that's like, oh, that's different. That's covering some new stuff. I'm learning something new that I never knew before. And I've never heard anyone else speak about, you know, for me, Bob Holness as Bond was always one of my favorite yeah. thoughts, you know, because like I, you guys probably wouldn't know him, but he was like a, everybody's sort of favorite granddad quiz show host in the eighties on a show called Blockbusters. So every, everyone in the UK would know Bob Holness is the host of Blockbusters and the thought that he is or was James Bond on the radio is just such a, a funny concept. But the fact, yeah, I remember you got the document, didn't you? His contract that he signed yeah. from back in God knows when it was. Um, so it's almost the, all those little, little amazing things that you dug up is, is great. And obviously you've done the, done a similar job with this. Mm -hmm. So uh, give some people, because I, like I said before, I, I, uh, I, I, I want to be careful that you don't, because I know you're super enthusiastic and I know you can talk all day about this and I don't want you to give away every last secret in the book. I want people to, at home to go and actually buy the book because you need one. Um, so give us some tantalizing tease and tantalize us as, as you said, when, when you answered the call just now um, with some, some nuggets that are in the book, some secrets that are going to be revealed, but obviously, you know, don't reveal the secrets on here. So, the, the premise of the book, as we've discussed, is that the James Bond universe is greater than you think. It's not just films and uh, novels. There's also video games, comic books, radio dramas, uh, and novels that are not available and movies that, are not, uh, that were not made. This book is an attempt to cover many of them. Um, there, I also 
there's Bond video games that haven't been discussed. Uh, there are, uh, I try to identify all, every actor who's played James Bond. I try to, in another appendix, I try to list every title for every film, novel, video game, radio drama, so, so that everyone could have that all in one place and every collected work. I also, oh, oh, um, J lost J James Bond comics, including a Dynamite comic that was a sequel to James Bond Origins. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is since the, the first spinoff Bond novel was The Adventures of James Bond Jr. 003 and a half. The writer on that cover is R.D. Mascot. R.D. Mascot did not write that book. That is a pseudonym. Oh. The identity of that author has been widely speculated, but never confirmed. I found out who. Whoa. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> well, if that doesn't get you to buy the book, I don't know what will. But uh, so there you have it. The Lost Adventures of James Bond by Mark Edlitz. If you want to know the answer to that question, go and get yourself a copy. And wasn't there another one? Uh, Sean yeah, Connery's Lost Bond performance? Oh, yeah. I was oh, going yeah. to mention that, yes. There's a Lost yeah. performance by Sean Connery. I mean, obviously, yeah. as someone who hosts the, 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 the comics of Bond here on JBR, all the, the Bond comic stuff in your book is... is very fascinating for, for me and I think you know anyone who enjoys those episodes uh, they'll enjoy that as well and then yeah uh, as Tom was just saying there's a lost Bond performance by Sean Connery we don't want to go into too many details because we want people to read it but um, that's that's incredible that you discovered that yeah absolutely all right well keep your, keep your lips sealed because we want mm -hmm. to by the book um and of course christmas coming up to everybody so uh you know add it to your christmas list if you uh if you're not going to get it immediately but i highly recommend you do and get uh, get both covers obviously you want the timmy cover you want the ppk cover and while you're at it if you haven't already get the many lives of james bond as well mark edlitz we salute you man i i love the uh, i said this to you last time but i love depths of your geekery man there is no stopping you i love i love how far you'll go to 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 glean a little nugget for us bond fans to consume in your books man so jbr salutes you my friend i am i am thrilled and honored to be here with you all uh james bond radio is 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 great i'm a huge fan uh your name appears uh, a couple of times in the book uh because of uh the esteem that i hold you all in and uh the inspiration for which you've given me Thanks, dude. That's a very, very kind thing for you to say. Thanks, Mark. We will no doubt have you back on the show at some point. So uh, we will, we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have you back to talk about oh, oh, One last thing. Uh, if, if you've read the book, please give it a five-star rating on Amazon. If you haven't read the book, please give it a five-star rating on Amazon. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's so important. It, it's so hard to get your book noticed that uh, a five-star rating on Amazon would be, would be the best thing ever. All right, done. Absolutely. And thank you all for listening and for having me here. No worries, man. There's a there's a command going out to the JBR. Family. Thank you, Mark. Go and, uh, go yeah, and give I, a five star review. Yes. <laughs> oh man, how cool was that? Oh, that was incredible. Um, yeah, uh, Mark is uh, his two books. I think uh, more than anything, they sort of enca uh, encapsulate um, that you know sort of get across. They, it gets across the idea that there's so much out there that we haven't really considered. If you just sort of narrow it down to just the books and the, the, the funny books and the, and the movies, you're missing out on so much. There's so many stories out there and even the stories that didn't get made and, or that seem outlandish or didn't exactly work. There's so much insight into the creative process that you have to, uh, for those of us who are Bond geeks, we have to sort of find all this out. So uh, you have to get this book. Yeah, it's it's incredible, isn't it? When you when you think of like I know I've never been like when I was a kid I was never much of a, a comic book sort of guy. I, I I remember there was a Spider Man comic that I used to read for a little while for a few years, but I was I was more of a of a book kind of person. But um, it does make the mind go crazy, doesn't it? Because I remember in all those like the comic books would have the crossover comics, wouldn't they? Where it was like Spider Man versus Wolverine or something like that, and you're like, whoa, that's cool. Um, 
and just to think of something crazy like Bond and dinosaurs together is just such a <laughs> bananas thing, isn't it? You, you imagine what that film would be like. It would be something like a Jurassic Park slash Bond mashup that just is ridiculous ridiculous as that sounds and I, I i would never want them to remotely go down that route but there is a part of me that would be like man i wonder what that would be like to sit and watch bond head off against dinosaurs <laughs> on the big screen wouldn't that be it just intriguing it would probably be a disaster but it would be intriguing so uh if you could hold up that book for everybody jack yes. and for everybody watching on youtube there yes. it is the lost adventures of james bond by mark edlitz so remember there are two covers there's the timmy one and then there is the one with the walter ppk like he said they are exactly the same book just uh one has timmy on the cover one has the walter ppk and there's a, a difference in uh you know print print page paper quality i think he said wasn't it there's like the, there's smoother paper in the ppk version but then right. you know if you're a if you're a dalton man then you'll want dalton on the cover so it's, it's up to you to choose or get both yeah, and make sure to leave him a, a five-star review on Amazon uh, you know, um, for both of his books if, if you can. Yeah, do that. That's a huge thing. I, I know with, with authors on, on Amazon, is uh, that's a big deal. So make sure you, you go and leave him a lovely glowing five-star review. Also, if you're a Goodreads user, uh, which is an app I quite enjoy to keep track of books I've read, um, you can leave him a review on there as well. You can find that book on there and leave him a good, solid five-star review on Goodreads as well. That's a, just an app that you can stick on your phone. And I think you can get it through the web as well. Just go to goodreads.com, I believe. All right, that's about it for this week. James Bond Radio will return. Until then, my name's been Tom Sears. I've been Jack Lugan. And we, <laughs> I, did, I said that in a weird way that I wasn't, I didn't mean to, but <laughs> we got there in the end. We got the, got the meaning across. James Bond Radio will return next week, everybody, with a, oh, is it? Hold on. Have, have I done my... Oh, yeah. All right. So next week, we're coming back with a little sort of little something a little different, a little Christmas surprise for everybody, a little stocking filler, courtesy of Mr. Michael Kerwin, who, uh, if you haven't been paying attention, has been editing this podcast recently. So a uh, big shout out to Mike and uh, a thank you for your editing skills and prowess, man. You're a good fella. Um, and yeah, so look forward to something coming next week in your Christmas Bondian stocking uh, that you will enjoy. Until then, everybody. Bye. Bye. Hope you enjoyed the show. Good night.